I have a lot of love for Star Wars. A lot. To the degree that people who know me say I have a somewhat critical blind spot when it comes to the franchise. I love the movies. All of the movies. I love the books. Both old and new. The cartoons. The Disney Plus stuff. And I think that comic books, especially the new canon Marvel ones, may just be the best way to experience Star Wars adventures. So narrowing down what to talk about took me a while, though I talk about how the throne room fight in The Last Jedi is full of sexual tension alongside the action and drama, or how Luke's journey into the cave on Dagobah made me realise at a very young age that stories could be about so much more than what they appear to be on the surface. What about Leia finally being given a worthy opponent in the guise of Queen Trios in the comics? Or how about Obi-Wan and Darth Maul's rematch in Star Wars Rebels? Or do I just make a 20 minute video about how Babu Frick is the best goddamn character to grace any franchise ever? <laughs> no, it has to be about what Star Wars means to me. About that one thing from the saga that will be forever burned into my brain. The thing I will look back on with a smile when I'm in the twilight years of my life. So I went back to the beginning of my love for all things Star Wars. Back to the 90s. There is one key piece of information you need to know. I'm part of the age group that Star Wars sort of skipped over. For the longest time, it wasn't really a known franchise by me and my friends. We were the age group that was stuck between the original releases having run their course and the prequels turning Star Wars into an ever-present pop culture force. Despite being part of this skipped over generation, my brother and I fell into being die-hard Star Wars fans through the mid-90s re-release of the films on VHS. Bought on a whim because the cover for Empire Strikes Back looked cool. So I initially watched them out of order, and for a long time, Star Wars was something I watched on TV in 4x3 rather than wide screen. The framing, not quite right. The picture had a grainy quality to it, and the colours were all a bit off. That was probably just our TV though. Everything this franchise had to offer was squished into a tiny box. I bring all this up because one of the most important things that happened to me as a kid was the cinema release of the special edition versions of the original trilogy. I can't remember what film we went to see when the trailer for them came out, but I vividly remember watching an X-Wing explode out of a TV and fill the giant cinema screen. The sound enveloping me and the ballet of X-Wings and TIE Fighters battling over the Death Star made me sit forward in my seat and take notice as the trailer moved on to showing highlights from all three films. This is what I had been missing watching the VHS tapes. This was something else. This was epic. This battle being chosen as the opening segment of the special editions trailer was for a good reason. For many, it is the defining image of the saga. Luke in his X-Wing taking on the Empire and destroying the Death Star. It is a sequence that has been rehashed multiple times within Star Wars itself and by other films, TV shows and games, but never quite equaled. It is a sequence that changed cinema through its combination of grounded design, pioneering special effects, and action-adventure drama. For me, the Battle of Yavin defines Star Wars. The Battle of Yavin's fusion of design, technology, and cinema epitomises the virtues of Star Wars. Within it, you were not only given something that audiences at the time of release had never seen before, you were also given something that entertains just as much, if not more, than it amazes. To fully appreciate the entertainment value of it, we first need to understand how and why it works so well. When you compare A New Hope to modern films with their perfectly simulated spaceships that can do epic manoeuvres and crazy stunts, with physics that make you believe that yes, Poe Dameron is indeed one heck of a pilot, it is easy to forget that Industrial Light and Magic pretty much wrote the rulebook on modern special effects with A New Hope. The sheer amount of time, effort, and craft that went into making the Battle of Yavin and other effect shots for A New Hope took up to two years of production time, thousands of man-hours, and many millions of dollars. With everyone from the artists to camera operators having to chip in one way or another, everything in constant motion, changing on the fly, with so many plans having to be changed as the limitations of technology and technique pushed back against the team's ambitions. This push and pull, along with a looming release date, forced them to iterate fast. The end result speaks for itself. Star Wars changed cinema, and the Battle of Yavin played a significant role in creating the modern blockbuster. A key pillar of the special effects for A New Hope was believability. In a film that contains spaceships, space aliens, space swords, and space magic, being immersed in the world of it and maintaining that immersion is key. With any other team behind it, the final result would be cheesy and over the top. However, thanks to George Lucas's cultural vampirism, everything in Star Wars has some grounding or equivalent in the real world. The Force is about faith and mysticism. The lightsabers and Jedi are derived from the archetypal image of the samurai. The aliens, a mishmash of pets and different cultures. While the spaceships are a clever mixing of fighter planes and American car culture. 
The car culture vibes make everyone in the world of Star Wars a mechanic. Some are better at it than others, but everyone knows how to get stuck in, fixing engine parts and droids when needed. Some characters see their ship as an extension of themselves, customising and modifying it to make it something truly unique, while others take to new ships like they've been flying them all their lives. The fighter planes come from the copying of archive footage and old World War II movies to create the X-Wing and TIE Fighter manoeuvres, which plays a huge part in why the smaller ship's movements feel so lifelike. They look, sound, and move like planes in a dogfight, which makes your mind fill in the blanks. The carefully crafted models coming to life on screen in a way that keeps you engaged in the battle whenever you watch it, even decades later. The other design element that sells it, and Star Wars in general, is the idea of it being a used universe. No sleek spaceships or retro looking flying saucers here. Instead everything has a layer of dirt over it, with exposed pipes and engine parts helping sell the illusion that these ships are barely holding themselves together. With much of these iconic designs coming about from practical necessity, just as much as translating concept art into usable three-dimensional models. The design direction was also dictated by parts the modelling team could source to build the ships. They had to feel in-universe without being prohibitive to source or produce. Pieces came from modelling kits, machinery, carved wood, and other more unique sources. Like I remember the uh, front of the rocket engine was actually a, a legs container. The, I don't know if people are familiar with that, but that's a, that was a plastic container for a hose that we could just get at a, a drugstore. Or in the case of Darth Vader's TIE Fighter, its angled wings were added to differentiate it from the other TIE Fighters during the battle, and to help maintain continuity. A simple fix for the problem of, how do you know where Vader is if his ship looks exactly like all the other bad guys? However, it is how they filmed the battle that has the biggest impact outside the movie. The ship's movements were captured with motion-controlled camera rigs shot against blue screen, the camera often moving around the models to create a sense of motion. The footage then superimposed onto shots of the Death Star surface or matte paintings of space. Methods and technology created for or refined from prior examples just for this film, kickstarting a tradition in Star Wars of combining groundbreaking tech with filmmaking to create exciting set piece after exciting set piece. Everything in the sequence is stitched together from multiple types of footage, edited together to create the Battle of Yavin. The Death Star itself is a mixture of models of various sizes, photos, and a large-scale modular set of boards that were used to record the flyovers and trench runs in the parking lot of the studio, switching between the various scales and cameras by cutting at the right time or blending two shots together, such as the flash of light from a surface cannon hiding the transition between cameras as the ships enter the trench. This is all very filmmaking 101 by contemporary standards, but the tools and techniques pioneered with a new hope have gradually evolved and changed to become the digital effects of today. They've also become more accessible thanks to the boom in personal computing, to the point where you can take a stab at making your own space battle with nothing more than a couple of toys, a consumer level camera, a lot of cardboard, and a computer. It all stems from this film and how this battle in particular was put together. While the special effects, even in the special edition version of the film, are showing their age, they still have an element of spectacle to them. They still excite and amaze because it is the story of the battle itself that draws you in and allows you to suspend your disbelief. The build-up to and the Battle of Yavin itself are the final act of A New Hope. What makes it stand out from the rest of the saga is that it's our sole focus for the final 20 minutes of the film. While every other Star Wars film and adventure movies in general cut between a climactic battle staged on multiple fronts, allowing the editor to pace the battle, cutting from one front to another when the tension is at its highest, for the Battle of Yavin we instead get a slow and glorious build-up of tension over time. The battle can be broken down into a three-act structure to highlight the key beats and moments that draw the audience in, keeping them invested in one thread of action for a prolonged period of time. The sequence begins with the briefing, a not-so-subtle info dump that gets the audience and pilots on the same page. We quickly hit the inciting incident. The Death Star's weak spot is revealed just as the Empire begins to close in on the Rebels. It's going to be tough, but there's a chance they can pull it off before they're all blown up by the Death Star's planet-destroying superweapon. Crucially, before we move on, Luke Skywalker absentmindedly says that scoring that one in a million shot isn't that hard. He's done it before. After all, he used to bullseye Womp Rats in his T-16 back home, planting the seed that Luke is a good pilot without really showing any of his skill up to this point in the film. Sure, we've seen that he has some affinity with spaceships, that he has an understanding of how they work, and hear that his father was one of the best pilots in the galaxy. But it's this line of dialogue, and then seeing Luke prepping for the battle, that reinforces the idea that in this area, Luke actually knows what he's doing. Our hero just might be able to pull off this crazy suicide mission. It is here that the battle being the sole focus of the end of the film starts to pay off. 
The sequence has given room to breathe. The audience has just enough time in the briefing and prepping to get to know the key figures in the Rebel Alliance, the pilots who will be risking everything to stop the Empire, and how our main characters feel about the upcoming battle. Han says his goodbye, so we know our protagonist Luke is going to be alone in this mission. He gets a kiss. For luck, from Leia, has some more reinforcing of his skill as a pilot by reuniting with his friend Biggs. Then, just as the ships leave for the battle, we reach our first key plot point. Obi-Wan speaks to Luke from beyond the grave. He has indeed become more powerful than anyone could have imagined. Only Luke can hear him, and seemingly shakes off his mentor's ethereal wisdom as pre-battle nerves. Act 2 of the sequence begins with the ticking clock that is the Death Star starting to get into range. The fighters report in and mount their assault. As the X-Wings turn to draw fire, we get one of the best shots in the entire film. The marriage of technology and cinema selling the moment as the music changes with the fluid movement of the ships heightening the drama. We then enter the first pinch as the X-Wings strafe the surface of the battle station, doing what damage they can while taking out some of the defensive cannons. As they start taking losses, Luke hears Obi-Wan's voice in his head, dismissing it once again. Then the pinch gets tighter as the first wave of TIE Fighters join the battle, forcing the Rebels to go on the defensive. During the skirmish, Luke's ship takes some damage to remind us even our hero isn't immune during this fight. As a TIE Fighter zeroes in on Luke, we get a brief moment of relief as Wedge comes to the rescue and takes it out with some direct fire. We near the midpoint of the sequence as the Y-Wings enter the trench to make their attack run. One of the pilots takes out his targeting computer, then everything changes as Darth Vader and his wingmen enter the fray, crossing the midpoint and turning everything to shit for Luke and his fellow pilots. During the second pinch, Vader systematically hunts down the Rebel fighters, taking out the Y-Wings with brutal efficiency. The X-Wings start their assault, and the Red Leader gets a shot off on target. This is the second key plot point. Despite the computer being bang on target, the shot fails, and the Death Star still stands. Act 3 begins with Luke, Wedge, and Biggs entering the trench. This is where things really start to go wrong. Wedge points out that the exhaust port is really hard to see, and he's not sure the computer will be able to hit it, reinforcing the idea that the targeted computer is just not up for the job. The enemy fire is also intensified, so the three pilots' only option is to go faster, which makes hitting an extremely difficult target so much harder to do. The bad times keep coming for Luke, however. First, Wedge is forced to retreat from battle after sustaining damage. Then Luke enters the worst point of the battle, as Biggs, his friend from back home on Tatooine, is blown up. The tension ramps up. It is now just Luke, Vader, his cronies, and the trench. No help, no backup, nothing. Luke is completely alone, with the Sword of the Empire closing in on him. The weak spot is getting closer. Luke struggles to use the targeted computer while also trying to avoid Vader's steady aim. Just when all hope seems lost, the familiar voice of Obi-Wan tells Luke to use the Force. This is the moment that not only the battle has been building up to, but the film as a whole. The true point of no return, the crisis. Does Luke rely on the tools he has been given that we know could lead to an imperfect shot? Or does he trust in something greater? Does our wide-eyed farm boy from Tatooine dare to trust in hope in the face of overwhelming evil? The music changes as Luke deliberates, and it feels as if time stands still as he listens to his mentor's words of wisdom. Then, with doubt removed from his mind, Luke Skywalker makes the most important decision in his life, one that will alter the course of history. He trusts in himself, and in the living force, confidently putting away his targeting computer. Almost immediately, his resolve is tested, as Rebel Command questions his decision, and Vader takes out R2 with a glancing blow to Luke's ship, as the Death Star moves into firing range. The super weapons firing sequence begins, and no matter how many times I watch it, I hold my breath. Vader closes in. Luke is dead center in his crosshair. He's not going to make it. As Vader pulls the trigger, laser fire takes out one of his wingmen. He lets out a sigh of relief as Han, Chewie, and the Millennium Falcon come to Luke's aid, causing Vader's other wingman to crash, clipping his TIE fighter, and sending him spiralling out into space. You then get one last moment of relief as Luke takes the shot. Finally, and with the help of some Freudian imagery, the torpedoes find their mark, entering the tubes of the Death Star, travelling down to and detonating in the egg-like core of the battle station. We hit the climax as the Rebels fly away and the Death Star explodes in a brilliant display of fire and lights as Obi-Wan's last message to Luke echoes in his mind. The resolution of the film comes thick and fast as the pilots are given a hero's welcome and are honoured for their valiant service in the face of overwhelming odds. The good guys have won, and the galaxy is a better, brighter place because of it. R2 tells a dirty joke, everyone smiles, and the credits roll. Every time I watch it, the Battle of Yavin reminds me why I love Star Wars. Everything I adore about the franchise is in there. Action, drama, weird space magic, and above everything, a sense of hope.
that no matter how bad things get, the light will always rise up to meet the dark and ultimately overcome it. The ambition of it still amazes me, the execution of it even more so. It uses a crazy combination of effects work and traditional filmmaking to create a piece of pure entertainment. It embodies what made me fall in love with this film, with Star Wars, with cinema as a medium. The perfect end to a film about a teenager with big dreams going off an adventure, dealing with the harsh reality of what that actually means, then persevering because doing the right thing is the only thing you can do when faced with true evil. If anything defines Star Wars, surely it's the battle that changed everything both within and outside the world of the film.